how are we supposed to live knowing that we and everyone we love are decaying flesh that will soon be food for worms? Throughout history, certain radicals have argued that instead of running away from this fact, we should live with a constant, ever-present awareness of our impending deaths. The ancient Romans would have a slave whose sole responsibility was to walk alongside a military leader and whisper into his ear, Memento mori, remember you shall die. The 16th century essayist Michel de Montaigne wrote that the ancient Egyptians, in the height of their feasting and mirth, caused a dry skeleton of a man to be brought into the room to serve as a memento to their guests. Other cultures still constantly embrace their finitude. Mexico has an active tradition of memento mori, rituals and customs designed to encourage regular reflections on death. And many spiritual traditions also encourage meditations on mortality. The Buddha, for example, urged his monks to engage in corpse practice, sustained reflection on death, loss and impermanence. Today I want to discuss some of the benefits of confronting finitude both on a personal and societal level and some practical steps we can take to begin to embrace our deaths. When I talk about confronting finitude, I don't mean superficial reminders of death. It's about letting death seep back into everyday awareness on a visceral level to taste death with the lips of your living body so that you know emotionally that you are a creature who will die. It is the passage into nothing in which a corner is turned within one. Confronting the fact that we will all die, that not one day of our existence is guaranteed, that every moment is irreplaceable and unrepeatable, can help us to savour and cherish the sheer miraculousness of being. It can help us to recognise what a privilege it is to have made it to this age, to get to experience this beautiful planet, what an honour and adventure it is. So let's soak it all up whilst we still can. Let's not throw this moment away. Death is our friend precisely because it brings us into absolute and passionate presence with all that is here, that is natural, that is love. One way to truly grasp how precious death makes life is to ponder what life would be if death did not exist. The philosopher Martin Haglund in Why Mortality Makes Us Free argues that if we were immortal, life would be meaningless. Eternity would be deathly dull because whenever you found yourself wondering whether or not to do anything on any given day, the answer would always be who cares, after all there's always tomorrow and the next day and the one after that. The writer Jorge Luis Borges in The Immortal, no one is anyone, one single immortal man is all men. I am God, I am hero, I am philosopher, I am demon and I am world, which is a tedious way of saying that I do not exist. And the philosopher Bernard Williams argues that we would be left purposeless and utterly bored because we would have achieved everything we wanted, so all drive and direction in life would be gone. To have an ever-present awareness of our mortality, on the other hand, infuses our lives with so much meaning. The annual time I go to visit my grandparents on their little farm in a forest in Austria is so precious because I know it won't last forever. 
my elderly relatives will be gone, so will the forest and their home. If I were immortal and guaranteed an infinite number of these holidays, then they wouldn't feel valuable at all. It's only the recognition that they will soon end that makes them so precious to me. Oliver Berkman, in his anti-self-help book 4000 Weeks, argues that the choices we make in life also become infinitely more important in the face of death, because when you know you have a limited amount of time, making any choice necessarily means shutting off the possibility of so many other life paths. It is because choosing one life partner necessarily means shutting off the possibility of meeting another, possibly better, life partner that makes this choice so meaningful. He refers to this as the joy of missing out in contrast to the fear of missing out. The idea that it feels good to miss out on alternative life paths because if we were never to miss out, any choice we make would never really mean anything. Instead, every choice that we make becomes so significant because it's how we've chosen to spend a piece of our finite existence. Confronting finitude can also make it so much easier to let go of the bad things that happen in life. After my friend Alfie died, whenever something bad happened, I found myself thinking, what would Alfie give to be stuck in this queue? What would Alfie give to have the pain of heartbreak? What would Alfie give to be stressed with work right now? Of course, we're all allowed to feel terrible sometimes, but this type of attitude reminds me what a privilege it is to get to be here at all and puts the bad experience into perspective, making it seem trivial in the grand scheme of things. To be clear, this isn't about the cliche that you only live once, which often seems to be a motivator to go on an anxiety-inducing quest to cram as much as possible into our lives. It's actually the opposite, the recognition of how temporary and fleeting each moment is adds enchantment and beauty to the mundane. I like to live life by the littlest things, feeling the grass between my toes, breathing fresh air, watching the wind sway the trees, enjoying the company of loved ones, a deep conversation, getting lost in a good book, going for a walk in nature, watching my kids grow up, just the feeling itself of being alive, the absolute amazing fact that we are here right now, breathing, thinking, doing. When we love someone, it is inevitable that one of us will leave the other. As the philosopher Jack Derrida wrote, To have a friend, to look at him, to follow him with your eyes, to admire him in friendship, is to know in a more intense way that one of the two of you will inevitably see the other die. One of us, each says to himself, the day will come when one of the two of us will see himself no longer seeing the other. The problem is that most of us give very little thought to the fact that we will one day leave each other, so we don't put our hearts on the line, we aren't honest about how we feel, we leave so many things unsaid and undone, and we take each other for granted, which can haunt us for the rest of our lifetimes. People usually wait until somebody's dead or is dying before they review their relationship with them. You don't really say the things you would say today if you would know that this is the last time you see them. I don't know if you're aware of that poem of the young woman who wrote to Vietnam to a boyfriend. Do you remember when I spilled blueberry pie over your brand new car rug? I thought you were going to kill me, but you didn't. Do you remember when I tried to make you jealous and I mean that with your best boyfriend and I thought you certainly leave me, but you didn't. 
Do you remember when I insisted we go to the dance and you wanted to stay home? I did talk you into it and I forgot to tell you that it was formal and you showed up in blue jeans. I thought you were going to kill me, but you didn't. And it goes on and on and then the last line is, I wanted to tell you all this when you came back from Vietnam, but you didn't. That's unfinished business. Continuously confronting our mortality and the mortality of the people that we love is one way that we can ensure that we don't leave so many regrets in our relationships. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus wrote, At the times when you are delighted with a thing, place before yourself the contrary appearances. What harm is it while you are kissing your child to say with a lisping voice, Tomorrow you will die, and to a friend also, tomorrow you will go away, or I shall, and never shall we see one another again. By reminding ourselves that the people we love could be gone at any moment, we are more likely to be aware of what is so precious about their existence. We are less likely to take them for granted, to leave them with unfinished business, and we are more likely to be fully present and truly cherish the time that we spend with them. The quality of love we have for them may be even richer because every day we spend together we remind ourselves how valuable that time really is. When my friend Alfie died I noticed a palpable shift in my approach to people that I love. I fully internalized that someday I would say goodbye to every single person that I loved. I felt this fierce urgency that I no longer had time for half measures. I don't wait to tell the people that I love that I love them. I reconcile with people, resolving conflicts as soon as possible. I don't leave loose ends untied. I don't leave things unsaid and undone. I more easily get past the superficialities with people. And I hold more tightly to the people that remain. I want to feel their heartbeats. I want the memory of their flesh and bones with me. I'm of course not always perfectly present or appreciative or reconciliatory, that would be unrealistic, but I do think it's a life shift that has added so much richness and intensity to my relationships. My therapist is the most joyful, um, the most joyful person I know, the most open-hearted per uh, person I know, and she's a cancer survivor. And um, and she t often talks about how the seed of her joy is um, the fact that she's always present to the inevitability, the inevitability of of our goodbyes um, to this life, to this world, to this earth, and to each other, and it will happen to every single one of us. And, um, and I know that can cause some existential despair in people, but going a little bit deeper with it actually stirs up, in my experience, nothing but love. We need not a tragedy or a cancer diagnosis um, to touch into that. There are so many ways to touch into that to look into the eyes of somebody you love and say, I'm going to say goodbye to this person someday. And to be able to do that every single day and to know that mortality can actually be um, a seed of, of our expanding hearts is really um, not being afraid to face the fact that we will all leave this world and we will all say goodbye to each other. And that um, that in itself is really a diving, uh, a diving board to bliss. In a capitalist society, we are taught to value individualism, materialism, constant accumulation, growth, money, success. We live in a zombified state of work eat, sleep, repeat. Many of us go our entire existences never questioning these values so we get to the end of our lives without ever having truly lived. Suddenly people realize that all the things they treasure they can take with them and they look back at their life and they say, God, I made a good living but I've never really lived. 
And then all their regrets, all the fears, all the guilt, all the shame comes to the surface. The sad thing is that people do that at the end of their life, that they re-evaluate their values and their variables. According to psychologists, truly confronting our mortality could help us reject the emptiness that capitalism offers because so many of the values capitalism instills in us don't matter in the grand scheme of things. For example, the psychologist Erwin Yalom, in his book Staring at the Sun, wrote that people who were forgetful of mortality live in a world of things and surrender to the everyday world whereas people who are aware and acceptant of their deaths undergo an awakening, a meta-awareness of their lives, a total shift in perspective, which can orientate them to more meaningful pursuits such as a life of love, connection and service to other beings and nature. To truly confront finitude also means to recognise how intensely mutually vulnerable and dependent on each other we are. We would be nothing if previous generations hadn't given us the gift of a healthy planet on which we could thrive. Or without the people who take care of us when we are really young or very old. Or without the trees that give us the oxygen we breathe. Perhaps the recognition of our interconnection, interdependence and fragility could help us let go of the hyper-capitalist fixation on individualism, self-help and only looking out for number one. And capitalist notions of humanity's godlike dominion over nature, other animals, planets and humans seems ridiculous in the face of the fact that we are all decaying creatures that will soon rot into the ground. I also wonder if the key to getting people to revolt against systemic injustices would be to truly get people to confront their finitude. If we really internalised the shortness of our lives, would we still allow so much of it to be squandered in pointless bullshit jobs? Would we still allow politicians, landlords and capitalists to take our mortality for granted? If we had a peaceful acceptance of death, would we be more likely to stand for something, to put our lives on the line for something, because we were no longer so afraid of our individual lives being taken away? To be clear, I'm not saying that confronting our mortality will magically fix all the problems of capitalism, but I do think that it can help us challenge the values we generally take for granted and help us improve our chances of reaching death, having lived life as fully as possible. So now that we've discussed the benefits of confronting finitude, how do we actually put this into practice? I think a great way to start is by becoming more comfortable discussing death with people around us. Talking about our fears of death, our experiences with death, our thoughts on death in general, what we would like our funeral songs to be, where and when and how we would like to die. I'd also recommend spending time and developing relationships with older people in your life or if they no longer exist, then people in care homes or hospice care and asking people about their experiences and wisdom and regrets in life. I just sat and listened to dying patients and if you can only sit and listen and hear what they say, they teach you not only about dying but about living. If you don't have anyone to talk to in your life, then there are also groups like the Feast of Life, Feast of Death Project, Death Cafes and the Deaf Positivity Movement. Or there are resources springing up more and more like Caitlin Doughty's YouTube channel Ask a Mortician which is all about normalising death. Or there are books like The Swedish Art of Dying or the Tibetan book on death and dying. 
We could keep reminders of death near to us like skulls or art that makes us reflect on mortality or I personally love to go on walks around cemeteries. I think there can also be something so profound about sitting in the primal realities of life, watching the death and life cycles of nature, sitting with a dead corpse. There are also many meditations on death intended to help us confront and accept mortality. The philosopher Plato in his book Phaedo recommended practicing distancing the soul from the body. I've also heard of coffin meditations where people will go and lie in coffins to remind themselves where they will end up for eternity. Stoics recommend visualizing our last day on earth or the last day on earth of someone that we love. We could also potentially learn from or or incorporate aspects of the death rituals of other cultures, the Madagascan dancing with the dead, or the Tibetan practice of letting vultures feast on human corpses, or the Mexican day of the dead celebrations of death. Or we could just create our own death rituals, either by ourselves or in our communities or families. A ritual that I have is that every year on the anniversary of Alfie's death, I will write him a letter of anything I feel like telling him. Then I will light a fire, or if I don't have a fire, then a candle, and I will burn the letter. And it feels very therapeutic. We could also follow spiritual traditions that recommend facing finitude, Ash Wednesday in Christianity, or Buddhist contemplations on impermanence. I personally love what Elena Zeyman, in a forever letter, wrote about how in a certain Jewish tradition, people will write a letter to loved ones, to communicate feelings and salient wisdom they'd like to share before they die. There are also many exercises we can do to face finitude. The Stoic philosopher Seneca recommended that every night we tell ourselves that you may not wake up tomorrow and every morning you may not sleep again. The psychologist Russ Harris suggests we should imagine that we are 80 years old and then complete the sentences I wish I'd spent more time on and I wish I'd spent less time on. My personal favourite exercise is to remind myself as often as I remember that this could be the last time. This could be the last time I kiss this person, this could be the last time I see my grandma, this could be the last time I have this meal. It helps me to remain aware that no moment is guaranteed so that I am present and grateful with all that I have before it's all inevitably gone. It's unlikely that any practical steps will ever get us to the point where we're perfectly reconciled with mortality and no one wants to spend every waking moment contemplating death. Sometimes you just want to sit in front of the TV and zone out and that's okay. But I do think to truly feel on a visceral level a continual awareness of death could help infuse life with the sheer wonder of being, can add deeper presence and gratitude to our relationships, help us to reject the emptiness capitalism offers, and could improve our chances of reaching death, having lived life as fully as possible. As the Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius said, Think of yourself as dead, you have lived your life, now take what's left and live it properly. If you liked this video, you may like my video on the denial of death where I discussed the impact our denial of death has on those that are dying and those that are dealing with the death of someone that they love and the video on the destructive impact 
our terror of death has on the world. I would love to hear all of your thoughts about and experiences of death and confronting finitude. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'd really appreciate if you could consider becoming a Patreon or leaving me a one-time tip or donation via PayPal or Ko-fi. Thank you so much to my current patrons for helping me to continue to make videos. I really couldn't do it without you. I am not just saying that, it's genuinely true. Thank you so much.